Welcome, everybody, to Crystal Kyle and Friends. Uh, today, we will be speaking to, how do you pronounce his name? Freddie DeBoer? DeBauer? DeBoer. De DeBoer? Mm -hmm. Freddie DeBoer? Mm -hmm. Like a boar, like the animal? That's my understanding, yes. Boars are cool. Don't they look cool? See, this is where it, it should be Joe Rogan sitting next to me right now. Because he'd be like, bro, boars are awesome. Yeah, sorry. You want to see I'm a clip of a boar eating an emu? To Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> In many ways, you surpass him. Anyway, I digress. Um, so really interested to talk to him. Fascinating guy. The more I read of his stuff and the more I read about him, the more I was like, oh, he's, Ooh. A, he's an interesting thinker. Yeah, for sure. Well, also, not just interesting thinker. He's got some interesting stuff that's happened in his life that uh, he's remarkably open in many ways about his shortcomings and mental illness and all sorts of stuff. So uh, there's plenty of stuff to talk to him uh, about with politics and plenty of stuff to talk to him about with personal life stuff. Um, it's funny. You know who's a big fan of uh, Freddie is Sagar. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Sagar has kind of a soft spot for like like real Marxists. He likes uh, he likes people who I mean Freddie has a very strong like class. Well, he calls frame. himself an old school Marxist. Yeah, that's how he defines himself. Yeah. So uh, when I told Sagar that we were having Freddie on, he was like, "Oh, tell him I'm a big fan." Funny enough, there was one political compass test I took where I was described as a classic Marxist. I believe was the phrasing. Hmm. Um, there's another one where I was libertarian socialist. I, I mean, it's all over the place depending on which one you take, but one, I was a classic Marxist, and I was surprised myself. I was like, oh, yeah. really? <laughs> yeah, I so. want to ask him about his ideology. His parents were radicals, so he came up with sort of like, you know, that was in the ether around him. My parents were not. <laughs> My dad was this not at all. <laughs> apolitical slash semi-political weirdo who the only time he would hear anything about politics was listening to Rush Limbaugh in the car on My like, the ride very, home. My parents were very, like, I mean— your mom as well, but my parents were very like local community active, but mm. in a very sort of not partisan. My dad was more conservative. Just because of guns, though, right? Guns. I mean, in general, he has a little bit of like a libertarian bent to him. He thought Ronald Reagan was a great president. Um, <laughs> my mom, she comes from a family that uh, like a lot of union you know, background in her family uh, and was a teacher, so she was always a little more like left-leaning, but um, neither one. We didn't talk about politics in the house growing up at all. My mom is the classic PMC that we always deride, professional middle class. Your mom is lovely. She uh, she went, uh, so she grew up in like a, a Republican-ish household, but it truly was like Northeastern Republican, which does mean like significantly more moderate than, you know, Southern Republican, if you will. Yeah, um, the so, Rockefeller Republican. So more on social issues, yeah. more understanding and all that stuff. But she made the full flip in the Obama years because she looked at Palin and she was like, yeah, no, <laughs> and she, she ran into Obama's arms. Yeah, my mom is definitely firmly in the Democratic camp now as well. It, I think that's happening with a lot of women, older women. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I think I mean, my mom had definitely voted for Republicans before, although she, tended, my mom. she didn't like Bill Clinton. My mom was voted one for person. W. Bush. Oh. oh, so my dad voted, I think, pretty lockstep Republican up until the Trump era. And my dad's big issue with with Trump is my dad is a scientist. And he's like, this guy doesn't care about facts, mm, data, science right, yeah. like the, he, he can't he can't handle that. But I don't think he voted for Hillary. I think he voted for who were the other ones that was like Evan McMullen. He might, I think he McMullen. voted McMullen or maybe Gary Johnson. Okay, or, McMuffin is the hilarious. I don't think one, he voted for Hillary or Trump. And then I do think he <laughs> voted for Biden, but I'm not 100% sure. So my mom went Obama 08. I actually don't. She may have went Romney in 2012 because he was very, you know, like Thurston Howell the third, like I'm a serious person. And she's like, oh, yes, you're a serious person. So she may she have had gone, that like Massachusetts background and everything. Yeah. Too, the Northeast right. Republican. But thing. she wasn't like it was a it was a thought for her. Like, hmm, who do I vote for? Uh, like, you know, th this is she's indicative of somebody who's not terribly ideological in how she approaches mm -hmm. politics. But uh, when Trump came around. She was like, not in a million fucking years, number one. But she didn't vote for Hillary either because she hated Hillary. Yeah. Uh, but then in 2020, she voted for Biden with a smile on her face because hmm. she was like, I got to get this guy out of here. This guy's crazy. Yeah. So Very all, all over the place and weird. Anyway, I don't know how we got on this conversation. <laughs> but uh, there is, uh, speaking of the PMC, well, it's not middle class, professional, rich assholes. Uh, Tell me what's going on with Hillary. Well, speaking of, yeah, the Clintons. So uh, Hillary Clinton back in the news because she is uh, hawking her expertise in a new master class. Expertise. Mm -hmm. Expertise. I think the course is supposed to be on like perseverance and grit and determination and those sorts of things, which first of all, reflect on 
how far you have to have fallen to go from thinking you're going to be the president of the United States twice to doing to a QVC infomercial for yourself. people <laughs> to listen to your master class, <laughs> yeah. like hawking your services there. That's piece number one. Piece number two is, this has been making the rounds, um, in one of her master classes, she reads the victory speech that she wrote and, of course, never delivered, and I guess is the first public reading of that speech. <laughs> Famously, they didn't even write a concession speech. I know. Yeah. And, well, neither did Romney, to be fair. A lot of these assholes are convinced they're going to win. Yeah, yeah. and— um, but they, and they were popping champagne and that. They did I mean, it in the middle of the day. When the thought, votes were still rolling in, they were like, we got this. They thought this was a, a done deal. And uh, so anyway, she reads a portion of uh, of the, the victory speech that was not to be. Let's take a listen to a little bit of that. I think about my mother every day. Sometimes I think about her on that train. I wish I could walk down the aisle. I wish I could walk down the aisle and find the little wooden seats where she sat, holding tight to her even younger sister, alone, terrified. She doesn't yet know how much she will suffer. She doesn't yet know she will find the strength to escape that suffering. That is still a long way off. The whole future is still unknown, and she stares out at the vast country moving past her. Okay. She, hold on. She goes on to say, um, "You will. I, I, she will never know that you will have a good family of your own and three children, and as hard as it might be to imagine, your daughter will grow up and become the president of the United States is the end of that little parable. Okay, uh, so for, that's the first time I saw that. I didn't see this in prep. This is the first time I'm watching that. Th that, that didn't go as I expected, number one. Number two, this is the same exact thing that I remember from Kamala's speech at the DNC when she was picked for vice I president. I had the same thought. Because it was literally the whole thing was about me, the gloriousness of me and my family. Yes, we're a special ilk. And it's like, this is kind of why you lost, because you can't even fake it in terms of like, this isn't about me. This is about you guys. That's why I'm here. I'm yeah. just a vessel for the will of the people. I'm a vessel for the democratic will of the people. And she she couldn't even muster herself to fake it. And I do think that's incredibly indicative. Now, on the whole, like, getting emotional thing, look, I get it. P you know, people feel, you know, most people, many people feel, uh, you know, these sorts of things about their family and their personal story and all that stuff. But most people also have the decency to understand that, like, People don't really give a fuck about your story, bro. They want health care. They want higher wages. <laughs> you know, like, th this is the problem with Hillary. Well, it's also, there's two pieces to that story. One is just remembering your mom. And, of course, that's going to make a, a person emotional, you know. But the, that the punchline of the story is, and she's going to know her daughter, you know, is the president of the United States. It kind of makes your point of, it's a little telling that that's the part that's emotional to her. And then the other part of this is, like, there's just no never been any reflection of the fact that you are the person most directly responsible for us having four fucking years of Donald Trump and possibly eight years of Donald Trump the way. And instead, and they write about this in that book, Shattered, instantly when uh, they figure out that, you know, Hillary's lost. They're in meetings to decide how they're going to frame this law. How to spin it. How to right. spin it to yeah. the public. Mm -hmm. And their spin was wildly successful because what did they land on? They said, we're going to we're going to blame Comey. We're going to blame Russian misinformation. And that sent the whole media down this rabbit hole for years. And now that we're sort of moving beyond the Steele dossier and the P tapes and the that madness, the extreme madness of Russiagate. But that obsession and it's going to dovetail with the next piece we're going to talk about over misinformation that comes directly from Hillary herself and from her paid campaign operatives who decided that they were going to make that the cover story for why they lost. And it's not just to protect Hillary. It's to protect the entire way of the Democratic Party over decades, really starting in earnest with her 
husband. It was this year was the, um, the or this week rather, was the 28th anniversary of NAFTA. Totally emblematic of the way that they intentionally shifted the Democratic Party away from a working class base and towards this, you know, rising coalition of the ascendant that they thought would entrench themselves into power and would enable them to be able to raise money from corporations. And so they didn't want to they didn't want to dig into any of that because that leads to a very different place than having freaking Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House right now. So uh, I'm actually going to go even a step further than, than what you're saying. You did allude to this a little bit, but she's talking about, oh, her and her family or whatever. Let me explain something to you. The Clintons are more responsible for the current state of this country than anybody else, than any other individual family, because it was Bill Clinton. It was the new Democrat neoliberal era. Mm -hmm. It was what's called the, the DLC, DLC the, mm -hmm. the Democratic Leadership Conference. And for those of you who don't know the, the details of that, it's very simple. What happened was the Democratic Party took a look at the Republicans and saw that uh, they were doing colossal amounts of fundraising. And they said, well, how the hell could we get in on that game? And to that point in history, Democrats largely took money from certain constituencies, namely lawyers, um, unions, including teachers unions. That was their base. That's who they went to for their funding. With the DLC and Bill Clinton, they came in and said, no, 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 we're a different kind of Democrat. We're not these crazy far lefty Democrats. We're new Democrats. And so we are also now going to start taking money from big pharma, from the military, military industrial complex, from Wall Street and big financial institutions. And it is as a direct result of that, there's a through line directly to Donald Trump winning. 100%. It's the neoliberal rot and the Democratic Party standing for nothing substantive that led to the rise of a fake populist like Donald Trump. So she's directly responsible. Now, a couple more points. Um, yeah, the whole misinformation thing. She just gave an interview to Rachel Maddow not that long ago, mm -hmm. and that was still the thing she's harping away on. Oh, over the, and over again. The current state of affairs in the country right now, she looks at it. She's not talking about climate change. She's not talking about corruption. She's not talking about low wages. She's not talking about any of these other substantive problems, the endless wars that she helped uh, foster. She's still talking about misinformation and disinformation being the biggest problem facing this country. So in other words, the problem is you have nefarious foreign actors and just bad, evil right wing people who are spreading misinformation and and creating this mass delusion in half the country. And so we need to control the bad people in order to get the good people back in power. It's a very black and white worldview of like, they're bad, we're good. How do we clamp down on the bad people saying the bad things, purge them from social media, and then we can, you know, rise to glory again. It's a very nihilistic worldview. Well, it's a couple things. Number one, it's very convenient because then you can say, yeah, it's, it's the bad people over there. It has nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with me, right. And the fact that there has been no reckoning over the fact Look, for all the people who, like me, justifiably hated Donald Trump, this is the person most proximate to giving us Donald Trump. And as you point out, and as I've pointed out, her family helping to architect that moment that created the opening for him to start with. But also, think about the fact her campaign funded the Steele dossier. I mean, you want to talk about disinformation and misinformation right yeah she is one of the worst offenders in terms of putting false conspiratorial information in front of the american public that the media went right along with not to mention i mean obviously you could go back to the way she helped with the uh, build up to the iraq war and that misinformation disinformation campaign so the people oftentimes who cry the loudest about this stuff are some of the worst offenders. That's exactly right. Mainstream media are some of the biggest purveyors of misinformation. And it, they've always been. That's the thing. It's not even like a new recent phenomenon. It, 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 you know, the recent iterations like Russiagate, like you're talking about, those are the clearest, most recent examples. Yeah. But I mean, literally the buildup to the Iraq war was because the mainstream media was just a stenographer to the State Department and the yeah. CIA and whatever they said they ran with. And so if they said, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction and we can't wait for the evidence to be in the form of a mushroom cloud, that, you know, the they would dutifully go out and report it as if they're doing journalism, as if they're doing reporting. And then they have the nerve to turn around and say, get these QAnon people offline. Now, no, I'm not downplaying the negative effects of any right-wing conspiracies and QAnon stuff. I mean, I do think that stuff is terrible and I do think it has negative consequences. But you cannot, if you are even bigger purveyors of misinformation, arguably that have an, an even worse uh, problem with the body politic, you can't turn around and point your finger at them and act like, you know, these are the people that we need to control. Well, it just reveals the game. Um, and you and I point this out in terms of the right 
It's not that they care about free speech and censorship, whatever. They just want to be the censors. Correct. Yeah. They want to be the ones controlling what's allowed to be said. And it's the same thing with people like Hillary Clinton and The New York Times and other people who have gone all in on this misinformation, disinformation thing. They're just mad that they don't have 100 percent control over the narrative and the space anymore. They're they see some competition over here from independent actors and that they can't con totally control the storyline anymore. That's what they're really reacting to, because if they actually cared about truth and accuracy in reporting, there would have been some sort of um, some sort of come to Jesus around Russiagate, some sort of analysis of all the ways that they went wrong. And the rock war, the financial crisis, the list goes on and on. There would have been some sort of self-reflection and tried to, ability to correct. But none of that ever happened, which just shows you Hillary Clinton and all the rest of the people who took her lead. Again, she explicitly decided this was going to be the direction for the Trump years. All the people that took her lead, oftentimes the worst actors in this regard. And, and honestly, it's a feature and not a bug like they don't even care if they're lying and they're wrong and it's conspiracy theories. They don't care. But, you know, they do it anyway. Now, final point. Um, this reminded me of the happy birthday future president tweet that Hillary had, mm. which was oh. arguably now the funniest tweet of all time. Um, and the list of stuff that uh, Hillary has blamed. Russia, Comey, Jill Stein, Bernie bros, sexism, racism. Am I missing anything else? There's got to be at least two or three more that I'm blanking on at the moment. But uh, thank you, Hillary, for your master class. Next time you might want to do a master class on something that you're actually good at, like losing. <laughs>